Good evening, everyone. It is great to see you all joining us for this uh, history happy hour. And I'm going to continue to admit people here for the next few minutes as uh, more people come into the waiting room. I'm very excited about tonight's talk with John Kosky. And uh, feel free, everyone, to use that chat feature at the bottom of the screen if you want to say hi. Uh, to your fellow fellow viewers and uh, tell us uh, where are you watching this from. I see a lot of familiar names and uh, some faces out there. So welcome and make yourself comfortable. Of course, this is a history happy hour. And back in the day when we were doing these in public, uh, we would. Uh, yeah, we'd have we've had we would have something to drink with us. I see John has something, so uh, feel free to raise a glass as we get together this evening. My name's Kelly Hancock. I'm the public programs manager here at the American Civil War Museum in Richmond. And I will just continue to uh, kind of give it a few more minutes as more people come into the waiting room. We start to fill up the program for tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. And again, feel free to use that chat feature if you want to say hi, uh, if you wanna tell us uh, where you're viewing from. If, uh, and during the program, if you wanna ask questions through chat, you're welcome to do that. But we are gonna do something a little different this evening and actually open open up the mics. Uh, so if, if you feel bold enough uh, at the end of the program to unmute yourself and ask a question, uh, you'll be welcome to do that. Well, let me uh, start out. Uh, hello, Larry. It's always good to see you with us. Saw that in the chat pop up. All right. Um, Helen. Helen from California. And Susie. From let's see, and Susie is watching as well. Welcome. I'm going to do what I always do: start out with a few announcements about programs that we have coming up. We have one last. And hi, Chris. Good to see you out there. We have one last program for the year on December 16th at 6:30. So that's this coming Thursday. We'll have a book talk with. Uh, Meg Groling, First Fallen, The Life of Colonel Elmer Ellsworth and the North's First Civil War Hero. So mark your calendars for that if you want to join us uh, again on Thursday evening at 630. And I know uh, in previous announcements, I had uh, said that uh, our hope was to start doing in-person history happy hours so that we could actually get back out into the community and uh, gather around uh, some food and drink uh, because of kind of the way the COVID situation is and uh, the uncertainty <laughs> that's out there. We have decided that the next history happy hour, which will be on January 10th, uh, we've decided to just go ahead and keep that as a virtual history happy hour. So that's good news for those of you who are watching from far away, like California, uh, maybe a little disappointing news for those of you uh, who are here in Richmond. But this uh, program on January 10th uh, will be a Civil War, the Civil War in the West photo extravaganza with uh, Gary Edelman. So uh, join us uh, for that program, mark your calendars for that. And hi, Susie in Ohio, uh, welcome. Now for tonight, I am pleased to introduce John Kosky, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him, although I uh, imagine that many of you are very familiar with John. Uh, John Kosky earned his BA from Mary Washington College and his MA and PhD in history from the College of William and Mary. He served as historian and director of research and publications at the American Civil War Museum from 2014 until 2020, and uh, John continues to uh, do work for the museum on an ad needed basis. And you might know that uh, before uh, the ACWM, 
Uh, John served in a variety of positions, including historian and director of library and research at the Museum of the Confederacy and uh, started at the Museum of the Confederacy in 1988. Uh, John is the author of dozens of publications, including the groundbreaking The Confederate Battle Flag, America's Most Embattled Emblem uh, by Harvard University Press in 2005. And tonight he is here to talk about Brothers Divided by War. And so with that, I am going to uh, unpin myself and turn the screen over to John. I'll be uh, do doing this in PowerPoint in a little bit, but before I do, before, and before I forget, I, I wanted to uh, thank some people before we get underway, and several of them are online. I see them right to my lower left, Dave and Kay Robinson, uh, among others, and Robert Petty and the wider Petty family, many of whom are represented here tonight. They know more than, than I do about this subject, so it's a little bit intimidating, I have to say. But for not only the donation of the diaries, but for continuing to share information and copies and photographs that you'll be uh, enjoying tonight. In fact, I also wanted to note that instead of showing uh, sort of historical images of every place and person I mention, uh, as I sometimes do with my programs, I'm going, I want to stick to the subject of the Petty Brothers. So most of the images you'll be seeing are of them or of documents relating to them, many of which have been provided by the family. So a, a shout out to them and welcome to all the petties from around the country who are joining us tonight. Thank you. And I'm going to go to share screen, I hope. Okay, good. It's working on my computer. So, so as Kelly said, I started, in a, my sound is good, right? I'm, I'm microphone, I had a microphone snafu earlier this year for which I'm still mortified, but anyway. Uh, as Kelly said, for the last 33 years, I've worked for the Museum of the Confederacy and the American Civil War Museum, and I've been privileged to make my living reading dead people's letters and diaries. And among my favorites over the years, no, it's not working. Okay, let's see. There you go. Among my favorites over the years is the diary of a Confederate soldier, Private Thomas Petty, that his son donated to the Museum of the Confederacy in the 1940s. A lot of Civil War diaries are really little more than weather reports and brief uh, descriptions of the events or usually the non-events of the day. As you can tell from this pretty representative page of Thomas Petty's diary, and he went by Thomas, by the way, uh, he had a lot to say and used every available inch to record his very long entries, and they were interesting entries. He wrote in full sentences and with unusually good spelling, grammar, and punctuation. He was intelligent and he was likable. And as you can see from this detail, his tiny handwriting was remarkably neat and legible. So you won't be surprised to know that he spent much of the war working as a clerk. His diaries became even more important to us in 2015 when uh, a descendant, David Robinson, on with us today of Grapevine, Texas, donated to the museum the diaries of Thomas's brother, John Summerfield, or Summer Petty, who fought with the Union. The four diaries uh, that, uh, of Summer's, di the four volumes of Summer's diaries are larger books. So they're a little less cramped than our Thomas's, but they had the same qualities as the, those of his brother. Full entries written uh, with impeccable penmanship, spelling, grammar, and punctuation. And he too was intelligent and likable, although a little bit more buttoned up than his brother. Maybe we can get the petties to battle with each other over who is the more likable of the two. But like the best of Civil War diaries, the petties described the places and people they encountered and the events they experienced. In, but they were more vivid and more detailed about it than most Civil War diaries. Their diaries are like good travel logs, often with pungent observations and opinionated commentary. So think Bill Bryson or think Tony Horvitz at time. And it's tempting just to spend the half an hour quoting from their diaries, and you'll see what I mean when I get started. But I want to use this evening to exploit the obvious opportunity that these diaries give us to understand how and why two brothers who were raised together ended up on different sides of the war, and whether and how exactly they reconciled their differences after the war. Thomas and Summer were the third and fourth of nine uh, children who would live to adulthood born to these two, Reverend James Spillman Petty and his wife, Margaret Eleanor Petty. Um, they were born in Stafford County, Virginia, across the river from Fredericksburg. 
when they, they were children, they moved to Alexandria, Virginia, and then moved subsequently across the Potomac to Washington, D.C. The parents subsequently moved to Front Royal, Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley, where they were living in 1861. James Petty was a Methodist Episcopal minister, as well as a tailor, who instilled a large, a, a, a strong religious faith in all of his children. In 1861, Thomas Petty was 25 and working as a clerk in Washington, D.C. When Virginia seceded from the Union in 1861, Thomas traveled to Front Royal, where he enlisted in the Warren Rifles, Company B of the 17th Virginia Infantry. He served in that unit throughout the war, although for much of it, he was detailed as a commissary clerk. He was in the Battle of First Manassas and in the Seven Days Battles here in Richmond, where he was captured and spent several months as a POW. He returned to his unit, which became part of Montgomery Corse's Brigade of George Pickett's Virginia Division. And as many of you know, Corse's Brigade was with Pickett in the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, with Pickett at the Suffolk Campaign in spring of 63 uh, in East Tennessee in 1863-64 and in the Richmond Petersburg defenses in 1864-65. However, not at Gettysburg, where Pickett's division made, made itself famous. The, um, excuse me, I also left out that they were in the coastal North Carolina in early 1864. Thomas Petty's war ended on March 31st, 1865, when he was wounded in the hand at Dinwiddie Courthouse. Two years younger than Thomas, Summerfield Petty was 23 in 1861. When he was 17 in 1855, he had moved to Strasburg, Pennsylvania to become an apprentice millwright working under his brother-in-law. In that fateful month of April 1861, he moved to Franklin County, Columbus, Ohio, to work as a school teacher. Unlike Summer, unlike Thomas rather, Summer did not enlist until the summer of 1862, volunteering in response to Lincoln's call for more troops. He served in the 120th Ohio Infantry Regiment and was promoted to Lieutenant serving as a staff officer for much of the war. The 120th later consolidated late in 1864 with the 114th Ohio, and Summer was made, uh, was well, actually he remained regimental adjutant for the remainder of the war. Not long after he enlisted, Summer ruminated in his diary about the gulf between the two brothers in this entry that might be legible to some of you. Home, he wrote on September 26, 1862, what thoughts come flitting through my mind as I write that word, when as an undivided family we assembled around the hearthstone at home and heard the passages of divine truth expounded, when my brother Thomas and I rambled through the forests or fished in the clear streams of the old dominion, then we looked forward to a future of pleasant intercourse, when we would be united in sympathy, but what a sad change time has wrought. He is in the army to arrayed against my country, and I perhaps am to meet him in the deadly conflict. Oh, that God would keep us from a meeting other than as two loving brothers should meet. It was his only direct reference to Thomas until the summer of 1865. Happily for the brothers, Summer served his entire war in the West, first in the Mississippi Valley, where he participated in the Vicksburg Campaign, and then in the Gulf region, where he spent time in New Orleans and served in the Red River Campaign. Like Thomas, his education and writing led him to a succession of staff and clerical jobs. He fought at the Battle of Arkansas Post in January of 1863 and almost died from diarrhea in May of 1863 in Mississippi. The end of the war found him in the ranks, capturing Fort Confederate Fort Blakely before Mobile, Alabama. It wasn't until six months after Summer's September 1862 diary entry that Thomas learned for sure that they were fighting on different sides of this war. On April 8, 1863, Thomas learned, quote, alas, of the apostasy of poor Summerfield to the Yankees. Then the following day, on this, the entry that's legible to some of you, he meditated further on the unwelcome news. Poor dear Summer, how it wounds my heart to think of him as a traitor to his family, to Virginia, and to all our earliest and fondest associations of mutual childhood and innocence. Little thought I, when we parted three short years ago, as only brothers who loved could part, that ere we met again, a wider than dives gulf should flow darkly between our souls and sunder our life paths for all time. Would God this cup had passed. So you see what I mean about these entries. A third brother, Henry, four years younger than Summerfield, also fought in the war. 
for the Confederacy. He enlisted in the same unit that Thomas did in 1864. Both brothers were not only observant and descriptive writers, but were also very introspective. They both recorded thoughts about God and their relationship with God and saw God's will and God's hand in the events of the war and in the events of their own lives. If this war has done me no other good, then it has at least drawn me closer to God and strengthened and brightened the hope of gaining a home in heaven when the strife and turmoil of this life are ended, Thomas wrote in October of 1861. His religious fervor intensified in the last six months of the war as he attended regular church services in camp, a kind of revivalism that swept Confederate armies during the war. My spiritual sky is cloudless and my peace flows like a river, he wrote in December 1864. While on post tonight, from six to eight and two to four, I had such a sweet communion with God that the picket line became the very gate of heaven to my soul. Oh, that he may continue to pour out his spirit upon me and help me to live for a moment by faith. The following day, he was on post and he got careless with his rifle. He had it pointing at his chest when he accidentally pulled the trigger, but the cap didn't go off. My companions, although not Christians, were so struck by the, with the providence displayed that they exclaimed with one voice, nothing but the hand of God prevented the explosion of that cap and saved your life. For Summerfield in particular, Getting and being right with God was his primary motivating force virtually from the first to the last of his diary entries. Like many soldiers, Summer looked to God for guidance and hoped that he would grant him the strength to do his will. The old year has nearly gone and perhaps it typifies my earthly pilgrimage, he wrote on November 30th, 1862. If so, God, would God to God, I felt that my life had been spent more in the service of God. If he spares my life through another year, I will endeavor to spend it in more active service for God. And on January 11th, 1863, after his trial by fire at Arkansas Post, he wrote, God be praised, I was preserved unhurt. Though the bullets cut the brush over my head and fell all around me, though I had no visible protection, I can say God was my rock and my fortress. In him I will trust. Oh, how God is, how good the Lord is to me. If he preserves me through this war, I will serve him more faithfully than I ever have before. Summerfield recorded in his diary surprisingly few thoughts as opposed to observations or descriptions about why the war was being fought and more specifically, why he was fighting. Late in the war, his, as his unit was uh, preparing to attack Mobile at, court, at Fort Blakely, Summer asked that, quote, God give us the victory and stand by us that we honor the cause for which, which we have espoused. And the next day, upon hearing of the federal capture of Richmond, he described a, quote, grand jubilee throughout the camp in honor of the great success in Virginia and the joyful expectations of a speedy termination of hostilities and permanent peace on the basis of the Union and the Constitution, for which thousands of precious lives have been sacrificed and the treasure of the nation poured out in copious streams. Before those entries, his references to patriotism focused primarily on the trials and tribulations of the common soldier that, that they faced and the, how mistreatment by the higher ups undermined their patriotism. Thomas, on the other hand, wrote often about the political situation. He initially bemoaned the fate of the divided union. Oh, that God may save us from civil war. He wrote on April 17, 1861 from his home in Washington, DC. My country, oh my country, I could weep tears of blood if it would avail to restore the old, the true union in peace. War will never, never do it. Although he wept for the union, he had made his decision and made his position clear in previous two days entries. On the very day that Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to crush the rebellion, he wrote, he said, wrote a joint letter to mother, father and mother defining my position on the crisis. The next day on April 16th, all my friends, he's in Washington, of course, nearly condemn me, but believing I'm right, I still cry, hurrah for old Virginia, whither she goes, I'll follow. Over the next three years, Thomas filled his diary with expressions of strong support for the Confederacy and admiration for Southern women who endured insults and injury from the enemy. Thomas's Confederate patriotism swelled in direct proportion to what he saw and heard about the behavior of Yankee vandals, as he called them, in Virginia and throughout the South. This cause and effect was in evidence in 1861 and grew stronger as the war progressed. 
threatening to grow into a very unchristian hatred of the enemy in the fall of 1864. Grant has given Sheridan an order to burn and destroy the valley and make it one barren waste, untenable for man or beast, he wrote in October 1864. I wonder God lets his sun shine upon such a monster of cruelty, and why the earth doesn't open up to engulf him as he talks upon, upon its surface is a mystery only eternity will solve. A few weeks later, he, he, re he said that Major B received a letter from Front Royal, where, where his parents were, after all, of course giving a sad and terrible account of Yankee vandalism there and throughout the Luray Valley. That account of destruct destruction and gratuitous violence, and gratuitous insult, rather, uh, would, Thomas predicted, render the Yankee name infamous and a stink in the nostrils of the world. On November 8th, Election Day, he wrote, Today is the election for the President of the United States, and I feel not the least interest in the result. War to the knife and knife to the hilt, till we, they are willing to let us alone. The choice of a constable before the war would have moved me more than the Yankee struggle for president does now. What wondrous change four years have wrought in my sentiment and feelings. In 60, we were one nation. In 64, we are a different people with different aims, habits of thought, of interest, quite as much so as the English and the French. A side effect of his personal religious revival a month later was to regret such expressions of hatred. I have cherished hitherto feelings of bitter enmity toward our cruel foe, but my eyes are opening to the sinfulness of such sentiments, and I am trying to follow Christ's advice and pray for them. He now considered, quote, patriotism a duty to God as well as to my country, and would enter a battle now as I would enter a church, looking upon it as an act of worship that would command the approving smile of my Father in heaven. We can speculate that there are different the, the apparent gap in expression of patriotism between the two brothers had something to do with their origins and circumstances. Virginia, after all, uh, both were, after all, born in Virginia and raised in Virginia. One brother was fighting for and largely in their native state, and thus had more reason to react, to observe, and to resent what was happening there during the war, while the other was fighting elsewhere and fighting against family and childhood friends. He, Summer, was less likely to harbor deep and bitter feelings toward an enemy that included friends and family. In fact, we know that from his diary, Summer felt great discomfort with the behavior of his own comrades in blue in the South. My heart is moved to see some of the sad effects of this war, which at home we never thought of, Summer wrote in Christmas Eve, 1862, shortly after arriving in the South. I am sorry to see a disposition of our soldiers to destroy everything they come across. In the closing days of the fighting, he expressed pity for Southern civilians who must, must feel the pangs of hunger on account of the thieves and heartless plunderers who find their way into the ranks of the army. The Petty Brothers Diaries remind us of something that we tend to forget about, the importance of the course and conduct of the war in explaining the attitudes and behaviors of soldiers, especially Confederate soldiers. We have been so concerned about restoring slavery and race to their properly central place as a cause of the war and emancipation as a consequence of the war that we improperly ignore or dismiss Confederate perceptions of invasion as a motivation for fighting and a shaper of wartime and post-war thoughts. Based on their diaries, Slavery and race played little role in the brothers' motivations or perceptions of the war. They were, of course, raised in a slaveholding region, but their immediate family did not own slaves. An uncle, however, was a significant slave owner and may have loaned an enslaved person to James Petty in the 1850s. So they were not certainly were familiar with directly familiar with slavery. As a Confederate soldier, the effect of Thomas Petty's service was to defend and perpetuate African American slavery, even if it weren't a conscious motivation. He recorded a couple of entries that suggest he unquestioningly, unquestioningly considered enslaved people as property. He certainly did not question the rights of his fellow Southerners to own other people, and he probably considered slavery as one of the rights and institutions he was fighting to defend, although he never made that explicit. Summerfield grew up in a slaveholding region, so unlike most Union soldiers, he did not witness slavery for the first time in his life during the war. Like his brother, he held an unquestioned view of Negro inferiority and recorded occasional demeaning observations about African Americans, but his experience as a Union soldier did affect his view of slavery as the war progressed. 
a faithful cook, quote unquote, named Joe, nursed him through his illness in the spring of 1863. And like a lot of U.S. soldiers, he came to appreciate the humanity of African Americans through their war service. We stopped at Port Hudson and found the steam sawmill at the lower Love Stockade in ashes, the smoke still ascending, he wrote on May 16, 1864. No white persons were injured, but 25 Negro soldiers were killed. Retaliatory measures will, I trust, be resorted to. If the government sees fit to make soldiers of the Negroes, it should defend them and vindicate their rights. But Thomas Petty was not a zealous defender of slavery, and Summerfield did not turn abolitionist when he moved across the Mason-Dixon line, no doubt aided in the brothers' post-war reconciliation. In June 1865, as he was waiting for orders to be mustered out of service, Summerfield made the first gesture toward uh, reconciliation. I wrote to father and mother today and to Thomas several days ago, he noted in his diary on June 2nd, 1865. I would very much like to hear from home. His father gratified him with a July 4th letter in which he assured his son, quote, that as ever you are most affectionately remembered daily by underscored us all. You speak of having acted conscientional throughout this dreadful struggle. We are sure you have nothing to reproach yourself for. And moreover, what gives us great comfort is the assurance that you are striving to get to a better world where war is not hard, where peace reigns. Then on July 21st, he noted in his diary, I got a very affectionate letter from Thomas, the first I have received since the war commenced. Oh, how highly I prize it. I am rejoiced to think that I can soon have the pleasure of meeting him as I am to be mustered out of service, mustered out as soon as I, the rolls can be made. So let's pause for a moment and can think about these exchanges. A lieutenant in the United States Army, an army that had just saved the American Union and emancipated four million people from slavery, rejoices to receive the forgiveness of his family. He was overjoyed to receive a friendly letter from his older brother who had fought for the slaveholding republic that sought to sunder the Union. For Americans today, this is perverse. This is the kind of a through the looking glass experience but it all makes sense in the context of the petty family dynamics. Summerfield and his family, and the family of his sister, rather, Jenny, were the rebels, that is, the ones who had, quote, betrayed the family. It was he, not his rebel, quote, unquote, brothers, who fought for the Confederacy, who had, who had to seek forgiveness. Other letters did follow, those initial ones in 1865, strengthening further the bonds of family affection and putting behind them this four-year struggle, including this one on March 10, 1866. I regret more than I have the language to express that we were not able to go into business together. This is Thomas to Summer. This has been the one great desire of my life ever since we have been grown, but so far providence seems to have decreed that our life paths shall diverge. Thomas is writing from his parents' home at Front Royal in March 1866. He hastened to add, if it should please to please God to open your way into the ministry, we would all be more than pleased to see our dear brother, herald, a herald of the cross. Let your future be what it may, the kindest, holiest prayer my heart can breathe, I will ever ascend on your behalf. With all the ardor and affection of my nature, I love you, underscored. In responding to a letter from his brother in July 1867, Thomas alluded obliquely to the war, referring to, quote, the eventful past, when we were both tried in a crucible by the ordeal of suffering, we twain alone can appreciate. As soon, my, my dearest brother, when I think of severing my right arm, as of letting aught come between us. Thomas's subsequent letters to his brother are virtually silent on the subject of the Civil War years. The word war appears primarily as part of the word warm. But as they had in the years before the war, Summer and Thomas went their different ways after the war. Thomas, the Confederate, moved back to the nation's capital, the capital of the nation against which he had fought, and worked into his mid-80s as Washington, D.C. auditor and in the assessor's office. Summer fulfilled his, the promise he made back in 1863 and devoted his life to serving God. He became a minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church with a succession of churches in East Tennessee, where his brother had soldiered in the winter of 1863-1864. 
Both brothers married their wartime sweethearts and started families. Summer endured the deaths of three wives and fathered a total of 14 children by, four, by the, all four wives. Both brothers were active in veterans organization of their respective sides. Summer in the 120th Ohio Survivors Association and Thomas in the Washington DC camp of the United Confederate Veterans. Thomas was among the Confederate veterans to accept captured battle flags returned from New England states in 1927. In this roto gravure image, uh, Thomas is obscured behind President Calvin Coolidge's right shoulder. They saw each other occasionally, re reuniting in their natal town of Falmouth, Virginia in 1909. Summer died in 1911 and is buried in the Union section of the Chattanooga National Cemetery. He spent the better part of his second half of his life in eastern Tennessee. Thomas outlived both Summer and their younger brother, Henry, dying at the age of 92 in 1929. He and Henry are buried here in Arlington Cemetery, shown at the dedication of the statue in Arlington Cemetery, the Confederate Memorial statue. They're both there, buried there, Thomas, and uh, Henry buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Not every family, of course, reunited, that was divided by the Civil War, that is, reunited as easily or thoroughly as did the Petties. We know from historiography, recent historiography, the work of Carrie Janney, that reunion did not necessarily bring reconciliation and that Union and Confederate veterans often remained bitterly divided over the causes and the consequences of the war and the legacies of the war. And we know from the work of David Blight that reconciliation between white Northerners and white Southerners occurred in part by forgetting the wartime roles of and ignoring the post-war fates of black Americans. That's the big picture of of the reunion and reconciliation. The Petty Brothers story offers us the often neglected little picture and underscores the importance of interpersonal relationships. The aggregation of hundreds and thousands of these relationships add up to their own kind of big, big picture. So what was it that allowed Summerfield and Thomas to reconcile after the war? First, there existed between them, of course, a strong and transcendent, transcendent mutual love on which they both could draw. Perhaps more importantly, they each nurtured and shared a strong religious faith that became more important to both brothers as the cruel war, as they both called it, progressed. They both subscribed to a, excuse me, to a faith that provided a higher law that transcended all other loyalties. And although they, particularly Thomas, nurtured very strong feelings about the right and the wrong, as he saw it in the, in the war. They were able and they were willing to subordinate those strong feelings to the relationships and the faith that they had in common. They were both willing to see the other's points of view about the war. Summerfield underscored, understood rather, and shared, shared his brother's revulsion for the wanton destruction that his comrades in blue had wrought on Southern civilians. In 1921, this is a 1926 interview, but 1921, as after the war, World War I, and Southerners fought in World War I, Thomas told a Washington reporter that, quote, although I fought throughout the war on the Confederate side, I am just as glad to, as, as just as glad today that the Union stood, as are the boys who wore the blue. And then in this interview, he said, I can't, I understand the people who think we aren't loyal to the United States. When we surrendered at Appomattox, we took back the Stars and Stripes as our own flag, and we would give our lives for it today as quickly as we would have given them for the Stars and Bars before. My son is a lieutenant colonel in the Army now and served throughout both the Spanish-American War and the World War. And uh, one, of that, one of his grandsons gave his life for the United States in World War II, and that Army colonel son of his is the one who donated his diaries to the museum in 1943. Both brothers had ch chose not to nurture wartime grievances, as losers in wars have sometimes done, sometimes for centuries, losers and their descendants. But even as they participated in organizations and rituals that memorialized their fallen comrades and celebrated their wartime service. Thomas was willing to accept the verdict because he was not punished for his decision to fight for the South. As he wrote in the conclusion of a brief sketch of his wartime service, quote, my career as a soldier came to an end with the Confederacy for which I had sacrificed everything I possessed save honor, which, thank God, was never tarnished either in war 
or in peace. They were both, they both forgave and were in turn forgiven. The reunited nation forgave Thomas for fighting against the Union. The Petty family forgave Summer for fighting against Virginia. As I was working on this program over the last couple of months and thinking and inevitably being a citizen of my own time, it occurred to me that the Petty Brothers experience offers us a healthy lesson for our fractured and often uncivil society today. So thank you, Thomas and Summer Petty, and thank all of you for your attention. And I guess we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, uh, one thing I was interested in, you mentioned one of the letters, uh, one of the brothers feigned this absolute lack of interest in the 1864 presidential elections. I'm somewhat surprised because uh, had Lincoln been defeated, that might well have uh, brought about a negotiated peace settlement as a way of uh, ending the war. Then my other a question is, one of the diaries uh, made the comment that most of my fellow soldiers were not a Christian when they were referring to this uh, fortunate incident with the a gun not going off. Uh, did he really mean just that these other soldiers weren't as religious or weren't as observant, even though they probably were nominally all Christians? Thanks. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, good, good questions. Both the um, that's my impression. The second question that um, his threshold for what uh, constitutes a Christian was a little higher than what most of them. They were certainly almost all of them presumably raised in Christian tradition, but they were not practicing professing Christians. And at that time in December of 64, uh, as it had been the previous winter in the Army of Tennessee, uh, there was, it was like a camp revival. And it, these men were probably not among those who were joining him in these organized religious services every night. I'm, I'm assuming that's the answer. Uh, his disinterest in the election, you're right, that is interesting. And in he's certainly the exception to the rule. Uh, not only were the news, Southern newspapers and, and military leaders and political leaders following the presidential election in the North and knew its implications, but so were the private soldiers and almost all the other private soldier diaries I've read and letters that encompass that period had took an interest in it. Uh, I, it he may have stated it, in fact, uh, overstated his case just to kind of record for his own posterity just how disaffected he was. Uh, basically a pox on all their houses, one, one is as good as another. I think it may have been a bit of hyperbole in order to, uh, to make the point of how, of how angry he was. How did Thomas Petty uh, react to the news of Lincoln's assassination in light of how embittered he was toward mm -hmm. the Union? Uh, did he leave any record of his feelings about Lincoln's assassination in, in, a, in the immediate aftermath? Good question. And the answer, unfortunately, is at least at this moment unknown. The, there, there are four diaries of Thomas Petty, three in our collection and one at the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park that was separated. That covers the year 1864. Uh, to my knowledge, there, the diary for 1865 does not survive. Uh, so we don't know how, how Thomas reacted. Summer, of course, was aghast, uh, serving in federal in the federal army, not as 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 angry and vindictive as many, including my own Union ancestor in a Wisconsin unit with Sherman at the time. Uh, many Union soldiers were uh, uh, were as angry with the Confederates for the assassination, assuming that there was some blame to be shared with Confederate soldiers. Uh, Summer did not have that kind of anger, but I, so we don't know. I mean, the, I, I've forgotten exactly how the 1864 diary got separated from the three that uh, that Colonel Petty donated, but perhaps by the same means, the what we can assume to be an 1865 diary uh, may survive somewhere today, and maybe eventually we'll know the answer. Great job. This is <laughs> um, I, I was going to ask, obviously, a lot of religion, uh, both of them very, very religious. Did they speak at all about uh, kind of like, you know, the action of war and the aspect of like what they saw? Um, I, you know, I think one of the, I think Thomas was wounded. Were they, you know, were they graphic at all in any of those descriptions? Yes, they were. They, um, 
Thomas, in fact, uh, the reason that um, Dave Robinson, as I recall, you can correct me, Dave, uh, knew about that we had the diaries of Thomas is that uh, Thomas's diaries are quoted in Joe Gladhar's book, General Lee's Army, um, that um, uh, drove Gladhar, loved Thomas Petty's diaries and quoted his descriptions of the Battle of First Manassas, among others. And that's how Dave saw them they're cited uh, in that book. So, um, and the graphic, not in the sense of a lot of soldiers' diaries are, I mean, there's one of the, the distinctions among soldiers' letters and diaries is how, this is true in all wars, how much did they share with their home folks? How, how, how graphic, and that's not the sense you, you probably meant the word. Uh, so, you, but to use that kind of as a way of answering your question, they were graphic in that they were detailed, very detailed. So the uh, sections, the, uh, uh, Summer's description of the Battle of Arkansas Post, what he observed during the Vicksburg campaign, what he observed of the of, in the the inactive parts, like the trip down the Mississippi River uh, to the Gulf, uh, very very detailed, graphic as in blood and guts. No, uh, graph uh, almost gratuitously. So as some soldiers sometimes were. No, but graphic as in detailed. Yes, but uh, I made the point of talking about what. To where Thomas was and was not, because when you say Pickett's division, uh, everyone thinks of Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, but he was not there. And he was oftentimes not in the ranks during the mid the middle years of the war. He was not in, in battle as much as he might have been had he not been detailed to the commissary. And that was true for both of them. So they their accounts are not going from one campaign and bloody battle to another. They're, those bloody battles are sort of punctuation marks uh, within their uh, diaries in which they're describing lots of not just bureaucracy, but the travel logs, as I mentioned, uh, both write beautifully to describe the country through which they're passing. They both t they both describe the human dramas uh, within camp huh, between officers and men and among men. They're they're wonderful documents for uh, describing the highborn, the the uh, generals like General uh, McClernand and General Ord in the case of Summers' diaries. Uh, he had personal interaction with some of the higher ranking uh, generals in that department. Um, battles are, I don't know what percent, maybe 10, 20 percent, but that's because they were not in them that often, probably even less than that, probably 10 percent. Uh, it sure. mentions you know, a lot about the animals. And one of the great stories about the death is, is uh, going from New Orleans over to the Texas coast, the, their ship gets caught up in a blue norther and it talks about the horses just beaten uh, terribly below deck. And, and finally, they get to the point where they have to uh, throw over General Orge, beautiful black filly. <clears throat> and when they throw him in the water, they think he's dead. He revives. And the poor horse is trying to swim back to the ship. And, and you know, because the boat's right, they're trying to put it out of its misery, but they're having such difficulty killing it because of the rocking of the boat. They they hit it and you know and and he he uh, just makes some interesting comments about how you know uh, often about how you know these horses suffer even though it's man's fault to have this war. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a that sounds like a fascinating account. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I'd, yeah, I'd love to share that with you. It's it's one of the best entries that, that are that's in Summer's uh, diary. Um, I just wanted to know, did Summer ever go back to Virginia after the war to, you know, to actually physically be back in Virginia with his family or did he just sort of stay away and they wrote letters? No, they, uh, he, um, he, he did go back, uh, visited, I don't know how often, but since he, he went from, he spent some time there immediately after the war, as I recall, and then eventually to Eastern Tennessee for most of his post-war life. But I get the sense that they were not strangers to, to Virginia in the years after the war. Uh, like I'll defer to Dave. I don't think he traveled there all that much, but uh, his parents were still in Front Royal. So he went there and, and one uh, interesting story that's in the family history is that uh, he was of course a minister and his parents were, you know, uh, were, he was dad was a minister and sometime in the early 1870s and went back and uh, he was not reconciled with his with his uncle Burkett who is the the uh, brother of James who who was a wagon maker and did have 25 uh, enslaved people at least in the 1850 census 
and he was offered to preach at the morning service at the Methodist church there in Front Royal and declined to do so because he didn't want to keep Burkett away from church because he was one of the pillars of that church. But he did agree to, to preach at the uh, evening service. And while he was preaching, apparently uh, Burkett did show up at the back of the church and they reconciled at that point. Wow. Well, and let, while you're on the mic, Dave, uh, let me ask you this, because a question came up earlier, and uh, and I kind of did a once-over light lay on this uh, based on the, the, the content of the diary, but uh, do you uh, do you get the sense that either, that either his residency for the six years prior to the war uh, made Summerfield, if not an abolitionist, which I don't, I don't get the sense that he was, but at least a conscientious objector towards slavery, and that colored his, both affected his decision to fight for the Union and his his attitude during the war. You know, it's awfully hard to say. He certainly has seemed to have more sympathy. Uh, there, uh, you, you of course quoted the uh, the Port Port Hudson. Uh, story and also the uh, the cook and there's a couple others like that yeah. and uh, you know summer uh, in fact the the way my my great grandparent grandmother and him met were uh, she came down from Boston to serve at a freedman school in Morristown Tennessee and uh, the Methodist Church was involved with that so summer was was part of that effort uh, with the, the education of African Americans mm -hmm. the Methodist Church. So uh, that makes sense. It's hard to say. I I can't believe he was an abolitionist, but I think certainly had had a lot of sympathetic feelings and and perhaps remember too he was in Lancaster County, which is uh, I'm trying to think Thaddeus not Thaddeus Steve. Who's the yeah yeah is that who it was? It was uh, yes. Yeah, so there was awfully strong abolitionist feelings in Lancaster County, which is where he was for five to six years. I think we had, we cut off uh, somebody uh, before earlier who had a question. Uh, I, yes, I, I think it. Niels has his hand up, so we'll go to Niels. Since there are tens of thousands of other white Southerners who serve in the Union Army, including a lot of Virginians, uh, particularly from West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, have you come across any other stories of, of white Southerners who fight against their family members during the war, you know, again, on opposing sides who did not reconcile after the war? Good question. I, I've, I've been so focused on these two for so long now in preparing for this that I not, uh, sources are not coming to mind in our uh, archives, in our own holdings that, uh, which is of course what, what is how I became involved in this. Um, there had to have been because you said tens of thousands and actually white and black the the numbers are up somewhere up in the hundreds of thousands of um if you assume that the mason dixon line was a was a was a hard dividing line that everybody who lived north of the line would fight for the union and those who lived south would fight for the confederacy uh there were some north who fought for the south but far more both white and black who lived before the war, south of Mason Dixon Line, who fought for the Union. And as Bill Freeling, William Freeling, has pointed out, when you're doing the math on the odds in the war, remember that has a double effect. It's that if it's 200,000 men fewer fighting for the Confederacy than should have, and 200,000 more for the other. So a 400,000 man spread. So the difference, it was it was enormous, and the the potential impact of that of that the failure of the south to have all of its potential manpower fighting for it but all that's to say that uh, with that many men um fighting uh against each other the odds are pretty good and the best possibility for it really for stories to emerge like what you're describing would be in east tennessee where summerfield settled after the war uh the the shorthand has always been the east tennessee was was, was heavily unionist and it was, but heavily is not exclusively. And so there were quite a few uh, pro-Confederate mountain Southerners. So I think Todd Grochi's book called Mountain Rebels goes into that. I can't remember whether he has any um, uh, good anecdotal evidence and letters and, from, and diaries from families to substantiate what happened after the war. But even in heavily union neighborhoods in the South, like East Tennessee, there were, it was very bitterly divided. 
and much of that much of the of the division was very personal and very interpersonal and that hostility did not die after the war it continued for decades afterwards uh, so i can't check give you any specific examples, but if you want to go to a high percentage location, I would look in East Tennessee for examples of that. And it looks like Mike Goodman has his hand up as well. So, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, was I was wondering, was the Methodist Church one of the various denominations that uh, split up as a result of the Civil War and then subsequently reunited afterwards? Thanks. I believe it was, and if my colleague Chris Graham is still on the line, uh, Chris is a, a religion church historian, so um, he, I'm going to ask him to unmute so he can weigh in with that. Yes, that is the case. Uh, the Methodist Church divided in uh, 1844 or 47, uh, Baptist in 44 or 47, one of the other two years, and uh, as you as you know, the uh, the Methodist Church reunited in the early 20th century, uh, the northern and southern divisions, but the Baptist Church remained um, divided and uh, continues to be continues to be so. Um, the uh, Presbyterians had split apart earlier, about a decade earlier, and it did have a little to do with slavery, um, but a lot more to do with uh, um, a lot more to do with doctrinal issues. Uh, whereas the Baptist and Methodist split was very specifically about slavery and how to interpret that in, in the structure of, of the churches. So um, the Episcopal Church did not split. So I do want to uh, thank uh, you all uh, for uh, participating in this program. And John, did you have something you were going to add? Um, it looked like you were looking. Uh, only to answer the question uh, about what... Uh, what unit my uh, ancestor was in, the 32nd uh, Wisconsin. In oh, okay. I, I somehow <laughs> missed that one. <laughs> Just came in. So ah. all. all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, many thanks to those of you uh, who uh, joined us from, from the Petty family. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, having uh, descendants with us. And uh, I'll just end by uh, doing the uh, a little plug for uh, just our members. Thank you to those of you who are members who do support the museum uh, through your donations. And we do have one member shopping day left at the museum on December 19th uh, that I forgot to mention uh, from 12 to 4, offering 25% off. But uh, it's been a wonderful evening and I uh, hope everyone will join us for another program soon.